welcome. Uh, we're very excited, excited to have you here today. Uh, today's webinar will guide you through a hands-on exercise so you can try our new cloud services, OpenShift Stream or Apache Kafka, and OpenShift Service Registry. My colleague Bernard Tisson will demonstrate how to set up this Kafka instance, how we can set up a service registry, how to use a standard specification for schemas and APIs. And finally, you will get to transfer data between applications using the Kafka service or as a streaming service and the service registry as a schema registry. Before we get started, I wanted to share with you three links that will facilitate the work today. So you're going to see those on the chat. OK. And um, so feel free to navigate to each one of those links and familiarize yourself with the content. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to do a quick introduction for both services uh, so you get kind of like basic information and then we're going to get started. OK. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Kafka ecosystem, super important for us. And before we dive in, I'm going to cover something that's part of our vision in Red Hat. And, and this is very important because Red Hat is expanding its open hybrid cloud technology portfolio. And it's doing this with a new set of managed cloud services that include platform services, application services, and data services. And the goal is to make sure that we're providing you with full stack management, unified, a unified experience, and also support across hybrid environments. In this diagram, if you see it from the bottom up, you can see that we have a lot of partnerships with the cloud providers outside, and we have created um, specific offerings for managed OpenShift on the cloud provider of your choice. And on top of this, we're designing this new set of cloud services that natively integrate with OpenShift and deliver a streamlined developer experience. So you can do things in a much easier way uh, related to build, deploy, manage, and scale cloud native applications. So we are going to spend most of our time talking about the two services that are here on the middle of the screen. So, what is Red Hat OpenShift Streams for Apache Kafka? And basically, that's a fully hosted and managed Kafka service for stream-based applications. The service has been designed for IT development teams that really want to incorporate streaming data into applications. That way, you can deliver experiences in real time uh, or even deliver a stream-based application. Um, there are three benefits of using OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka for our customers, and those three are exposed here on the right side of your screen, talking about how you can actually begin developing immediately uh, so you can deliver applications faster. The second one is that we're providing you a service that it doesn't matter where you have your applications, you can connect to it. So it really helps you out to simplify, simplify the application life, life cycle across hybrid cloud environments. And finally, we're investing a lot in something that we're calling the Kafka ecosystem. Because as you know, Kafka as a technology um, by itself is not enough. You need a bunch of other services that can really help you out to put together uh, the streaming platform or or being able to create a stream-based applications, okay? So we're going to talk about a lot of these today. You're going to get your own Kafka instance, and you're going to do a bunch of cool things. The second service I want to talk to you about today is Red Hat OpenShift Service Registry. And that one is a schema registry for Red Hat Cloud services that makes it very easy for development teams to publish, discover, and reuse artifacts. And when I talk about artifacts, I talk about APIs and schemas. Uh, this service is offered as a multi-tenant service. It's basically a SaaS service. Uh, and it can help you out or it serves as a central repository for API and schema registries. Um, it offers, um, it's compatible with industry standards, meaning that it has uh, all those um, certifications and um, a standard um formats that you can use and then finally this service um 
supports it's it's completely supported with Red Hat OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka, but you can also use it with other services like OpenShift API management. Okay, the service is fully hosted and managed by Red Hat. And what that means is that we offer 24 seven premium support and a 99.95% SLA. Very quickly, I already mentioned this, but let's mention it again. Service register, registry provides full integration with Red Hat OpenShift strings for Apache Kafka. So it allows you to map your Kafka topics to the appropriate schemas, okay? So it helps you to do things like governance and centralization of all the schemas. It allows you to do the couplings because as you put some of the schema outside of your application, it helps you out to decouple that information from the application, making it more efficient and helping you to reduce cost. And finally, it provides visibility for you uh, when you have a larger catalog of uh, schemas, uh, maybe your developers have created a bunch of them and they're all stored on, stored on that service registry. And it can support discoverability of those. Not only that, it can help you out with serialization and deserialization as well as making sure that all the schemas and APIs that you have there are compatible. Uh, finally, one last thing names so you're gonna hit you saw that the names of our products are really long uh, for that reason you're gonna hear us shorten some of the names as we talk about especially bernard and we're gonna talk about like instead of calling red hat open shape streams for apache kafka you'll hear us say manage kafka or just kafka in the case of service registry the same we will call it the registry sometimes service registry so uh we're just trying to uh make it easier to consume when we're talking about these services um so let's talk about what brings you here today okay so what we're gonna do today we're gonna try kafka and service registry so the goals for this session are supporting you on the creation provision and usage of the managed kafka service as well as the service registry. The third step, you're gonna deploy a Quarkus-based Java application to an OpenShift cluster. And we're gonna help you out or show you how you can produce and consume Kafka messages in Avro format. So what are you gonna need for this today? So first, your Red Hat account. We send you an email uh, yesterday and during registration that ask you to please create a Red Hat account. Uh, we need you to have those cre credentials handy. Um, those credentials are gonna let you use all our environment. And once you're all authenticated, it will be very easy for us to give you access to the system. So this is not a marketing thing. This is really uh, just a usage, uh, a user-based authentication. So I just need you to make sure that you create a Red Hat account. Um, second, we're gonna, you're gonna have to request a Kafka instance. If you didn't do it before, we're gonna walk you through it. Third one is that you need to request a service registry instance as well. All of this happens on the same page. Very easy, wizardy-oriented menus. You, you'll get there fast. And then the last one is to request an OpenShift cluster. So we're gonna have, you're gonna be exposed to a lot of technology today, many systems. Uh, so pay attention, we have all the links for you, we have all the steps, and even if you get lost, you're gonna be able to read it yourself. Uh, we're gonna keep a very fast pace today. So again, the links that you need today, I copy them on the chat, first one, they're organized here by priority. The first one is the Red Hat Scholars GitHub IO. If you see that link, on the chat, please click on that one. That one will have you all the step-by-step -step instructions that you need to complete this workshop. Bernard will work, work or walk you through many of the steps, but I need you to have that handy just in case you, you know, like we, you're, you lose your pace or you want to go faster or you just want to have it to, to have the link to do it later. The second one is our Dev Nation Slack channel. So we love Slack at Red Hat. And basically what we have here is a Dev Nation channel where we 
carry on very amazing technical discussions. You get a lot of support for developers, DevOps, for architects, all of you that are looking for information that you want to troubleshoot, that you want to ask questions, please engage with us, ask us questions. And finally, you have the workshop guide. You won't be needing that one today. That guide does have the links. So if you didn't, don't want to copy them from the chat, you can find them there. It's a nice guide to have. You can read it anytime. Um, and that's pretty much everything that I have. So without further ado, what I want to do is give it away to Bernard Tisson. And I hope you enjoy the workshop. OK, thank you, Jennifer, for this nice introduction. So hi. So. What we're going to do today, in a nutshell, is what you see on the slide here, but let me put some context. So uh, some of you might have uh, been in one of our earlier workshops that we did around OpenShift streams for Apache Kafka earlier, well, last year, actually. So where basically we touched base in the sense that you created an open, in those workshops, you create an instance of Apache Kafka and then deployed a applications to uh, send messages over this uh, over this Kafka instance. Today we're gonna take it a step further and introduce service registry to that mix. And why do we need a registry when talking about Kafka? Well, it's very simple. So Apache Kafka itself does not make any assumptions about the message format. So you can use things like JSON or just text or whatever MIME type. So Popular formats include, include like binary formats like protobuf and avro. And the advantages of these uh, binary uh, formats is that they are a lot more compact than, for instance, JSON. So you need less storage space, less bandwidth. The downside or the downside, the uh, let's say what they have as a characteristic is they require a schema to serialize and deserialize. And typically, that schema is stored and managed in a schema registry. So what we call here our managed service registry. So what we're going to do today in that workshop is provision a managed Kafka instance, provision a managed service registry instance, and then actually have two Quarkus applications, one that's a producer and one that's a consumer. So the producer will send messages which represent the quote, that's not that important. So in Avro format, so, and the consumer will consume those messages. So the producer will get the schema from the registry or at the first time it produces, if there is no schema, it might uh, register the schema itself. So that's what we're gonna do. So then the schema is in the service registry instance and the consumer, when it gets a message, the message contains the global ID of the schema from the registry. So the consumer can get the schema from the service registry and use that to deserialize the message. So this is basically what we're going to do. And with that, I'm going to share my screen and turn to the uh, share screen. There we go. Uh, yes, yeah, share screen. And I'm going to share this screen. So what you should be seeing is actually the front page of the workshop guide. So the guide is published on, on uh, GitHub pages. So you can go back to it anytime you want. And it's formatted. So we have three steps today. Provision a Kafka instance, create a service registry instance, and then use Quarkus applications to actually use Kafka and service registry. We made it. We made the uh, the workshop in such a way that you don't have to install anything on your laptop to actually do the workshop. So the only thing you will need is a browser window. Okay. So the first page here in that guide is actually kind of introduction, and you see the same architecture that you saw on the slide uh, a couple of seconds ago. So we can move directly to the first section, and that's provision a Kafka instance in OpenShift Streams for Apache Kafka. So for this, you need a couple of steps. I suppose that you have a Red Hat account. So if you have that Red Hat account, you can go immediately to 
console.rehab.com. So let me copy that link. I will paste that in the browser. In my experience, what works best is Chrome Incognito, but Firefox should work as well. So, but for this session, I'm going to use Chrome Incognito. So I go to the landing page of uh, console.rehab.com where it first asked me to log in. I'm going to use one of my uh, accounts. So you should, if you follow along, definitely you use your own account. So username and passwords. And that logs me in into console.rehab.com, which is like our general landing page for everything cloud services, both OpenShift, but also the application services. To provision a Kafka instance, I will go here to application services. And then you see, for instance, oh, let's, okay. You see this uh, this blue button here. I can click that one. That will actually go to here streams for Apache Kafka and then Kafka instances. I have no Kafka instance provisioned. So with the Red Hat ID, and you can create a Kafka instance, a trial instance that will stay up for 48 hours and that you can use as you wish. So that's what I'm going to do. So create Kafka instance. It needs a name. Devnation. Uh, we only support one cloud provider at the moment, that's Amazon, but you can select your region. Now I am in Europe, so I'm going to take Ireland. That's closest to me. If you're in the US, you probably want to take Virginia. And then I can do create instance. What you see here on the right are the uh, information of the instance, so duration 48 hours and some other limits. But as you can see, if you're familiar with Kafka, those are pretty liberal limits. So you can really use that Kafka instance to do to experiment with stuff during during two days. So if I do create instance, my screen should refresh here. Yes, and my creation is pending. This is gonna take a couple of minutes, one, two minutes max. What we can do if you follow along, what you can do in the meantime while the Kafka instance is being created you also will need a service account. So both the Kafka instances and the service instances that we're gonna create uh, later are protected, are secured with service accounts. So you need a service account to access those instances. So we can do here, if you on the left side menu, of application services, you click on service account. Well, you see that I already have one, but I'm going to create a new one for the sake of this workshop. You can have up to five service accounts per Red Hat account ID in, in, in this setup. So if I create a service account, again, I will give it a name. And if I do create, it will create a service account. Now, what's important is that the service account has a ID and a secret. If I close this window, I cannot get to the secret anymore. So it's very important that you copy those because we will need them later. So you copy the client ID and you copy the client secret somewhere in a text editor. And then you say, I have copied and you can close that window and your service account is created, okay? Let's go back to my Kafka instance here and see where we are. It's still being created. While this is going, we can move directly. So I'm, I'm, this is not exactly the, uh, the same order as in the workshop, but otherwise we will have too much dead moments here. So why my Kafka instance is being created, I can already jump to my service registry. So if I go here in the left menu, you click on service registry and service registry instance. You get an overview of the service registry instance. As you can see, I have none. So I can create one. I do create service registry instance. I will give it the name as well. So DevNation. 
it has some limits. So here the duration will be two months. It will stay up for two months. You can have up to 10,000 artifacts and some other lim limitations for this trial. If I do create, a instance will be created and that should be fairly fast because there is a difference. Okay, there, there, From a technical point of view, the service registry is actually a multi-tenant instance. So when you create a service registry, you get a share of a big installation, hosted installation of service registry. So the, the time to create is just the time to create this tenant. So that's very fast. While with streams for Apache Kafka, you get your own Kafka instance that needs to be provisioned from scratch. So that's why it takes a little bit longer. But it should, I'm a bit surprised it takes, it's still busy. Let's wait a couple of instances more, but or maybe refresh my screen. That sometimes helps to refresh the states. No, it seems it's still being created. So, uh, okay, so let's jump then to yet another phase that we will have to do anyway, and that is the uh, developer sandbox, okay? So for that, you open a new tab on your browser, and here the link is, the link is what you see. Let's see, I'm already at pay, at uh, chapter three here in the guide, so but we can come back at any time. It's just to, so here it will explain how you can get to the uh, to the developer sandbox. So actually we're gonna use Code Ready Workspaces, which is a web-based IDE to actually run some Quarkus applications. And we can use Code Ready Workspaces on top of developer sandbox. And all this allows us not to have to install anything on our laptop to actually do all this. So. This is the link that I need for this, developers.reddit.com, then developer sandbox gets started. So if I go back here, I click on that link, you go to getting started and it says launcher. So if this is the first time you do that with your Reddit account ID, there might be some additional steps where basically your account needs to be approved for Dev Sandbox. And if you don't have a Red Hat email address, that will probably include a phone ver verification. And in case you wonder why all this is needed, the developer sandbox is actually a share of a hosted OpenShift, so you can deploy applications. And obviously what we want to avoid is that people start to create fake accounts where they start to deploy things to do crypto mining and stuff. So as a way to to protect us against abuse we do this phone uh, verification so you will have to enter your phone number and then you get like a text message with a code which we you will have to enter but i don't have to do all this so i can go directly to my developer sandbox well actually there is a second step start using your sandbox and then this will normally open a new well actually not the window it's in the tab goes now to my dev sandbox uh and it goes directly to the topology view but the only thing we're gonna use on today on uh on uh, the dev sandbox is Cloud Ready Workspace, and to get to the Cloud Ready Workspace, you see here this icon here, this kind of square icon with nine little squares. If you click on that one, you will see that Red Hat Applications Code Ready Workspaces, if you click on that link, that will open a new tab to the, uh, to, uh, to, uh, Cloud uh, to code ready workspaces. You click on the login link with Dev Sandbox. You might need to give some extra permissions, but that's all okay. That's expected. And then, yeah, this because code ready workspace has its own SSO instance, which only knows your username. He asked for some other stuff. So uh, your email address, which in my case is. 
capital X with a plus sign. And I can put my name here. And then I should be able to do submit. And this will go to Code Ready Workspace. So I will leave it here for the moment. The Code Ready Workspace is later in this workshop. We're going to create a workspace and do the work. But now, by then, my streams for Apache Kafka. Let's, let's force a refresh here. Whoa, that's not what I, that's not what I wanted. So let's go back to my service registry and then back to streams for Apache Kafka because, okay, this is ready. So my Kafka instance is ready to be used. Now there are a couple of additional steps that we need to do. That That's, first of all, we need to, and this, I'll go back to the guide a second. So we are provisioned Kafka instance. We have our Kafka instance. We created a service account. So now we need to do a couple of things. So first of all, we need the bootstrap URL because we're gonna need that to configure our, uh, our Quarkus application. So if I go to this, uh, this kebab icon here for my uh, Kafka instance and I click on connection, this first thing here, bootstrap server, that's my bootstrap URL that allows applications to connect to my Kafka instance. I will need that. So I will copy that and paste that in where I pasted also my service account, client ID, and client secret. I will also need a little bit down the token endpoint URL. So my Kafka, my Kafka instance is, uh, is secured with uh, a SASL OR beer uh mechanism so that uses uh sso behind behind the scenes so i need the token endpoint to get a token so i need that url so i copy that url as well okay and then i have already a service account you can create a service account from here as well but i've already done that so now i can actually and that's the next step, if we go to the guide, so I did all this. Now I need to set permissions for my service account, okay, for my Kafka instance. So if I go back to my uh, console.rela.com, if I click on actually the name of my Kafka instance, I will see number of a screen with the number of tabs. So there is a dashboard. Now, I haven't used it, so there is not a lot of data here to be seen. I haven't created a topic, so there are no topics. I have no consumer group, but what I want to do here is set the access level. So if you go to the access window, you will see that those are the default access. So all accounts that include all usernames, all service accounts have some limited access to the Kafka instance. You can describe the Kafka instance, the describe consumer group, describe topics. So that's not enough to actually produce the to to topics, consume from topics, we need more. So we can now give our service account the necessary uh, permissions. So if I click on manage access, I can select a service account. You can create all accounts, but I'm gonna create the one that I just created. I'm gonna use this one. So it was called DevNation, okay? If I click next, those are the existing ones because those were for all accounts. But now I can assign permissions for my service account. And here again, I can go fairly wide or fairly granular. So for this workshop, I need actually two permissions. Uh, I need to be able, well, I need to able to produce, but I'm gonna use manage success here. So, if I do manage access, no, actually they changed that screen since yesterday. Okay, I need to do something else here. So they actually changed this dialog. So this is the first time I see this. So I need to be able to consume from a topic, yes? So topic starts with, okay. So I need to consume from a topic. I can use the is 
and then I can use a star. So let's say that's for all topics, okay? So, and then the consumer group, same thing. I will give rights to all kinds of all consumer groups. So again, I can use a star here. And then I can, that's one permission. The other permission that I need is I need to be able to, oh, but here I can do now other things. Oh, this is a bit confusing here. If I do topic is, again, star. Allow, and I can do right. Okay. So this will give me read access to all the topics and write access to all the topics and read access to all the consumer groups. And I think this is more or less what I need. Consumer group, well, actually I can change the topic one just to be on the safe side. I can do allow all, okay? So if I save that now, this, okay. Oh yeah, there you are. My service account can read all the consumer groups. It can has rights to all the topics. And then, yeah, this actually those are now obsolete. They are superseded by this one. But this is, and I'm gonna double check just to be sure, but this is more or less, yes, this is what I need to be able for my service account to consume and produce to my Kafka instance. Okay, now that we are here, we can also create a topic that we will need. So there is a wizard for this as well. So I don't have any topics yet, so I can create a topic. And for the sake, so a topic needs a name. For this workshop, my Quarkus applications, they expect the name quotes as a topic name. So they will use a topic name quotes. So I'm gonna use this as the name of the topic that I'm gonna create here. And then, you can choose the number of partitions. So partitions is one of the things that makes Kafka scale because it allows you to scale out your consumers. For this workshop, one partition is, is enough, but you can create more if you want. So let's keep it to one for this example here. Retention time is how long uh, messages in a topic will be retained. So the default here with the managed with or managed instance is a week in time and un unlimited size. As I know that my Kafka instance will be destroyed within two days, a week is more than enough. So I can keep the defaults here as well. And then the replicas is not something that you can change today. So the managed Kafka instance has three brokers. So we use three replicas for every topic with two minimum in sync. Re replica, so this is more informative. You cannot change those values. If I click finish, my topic will be created. One partition, seven days retention time. Well, here it's in milliseconds. That's a lot of milliseconds and unlimited retention size, okay? So that's what I need to set up my, uh, my Kafka instance. So I did the topic as well. If I go back to, now we can go to service registry instance. I already created my instance. What I still need to do now is to, okay, yeah, I need the URL to, do, to connect. So if I go to service registry and I do service registry instances, I click on this kebab icon on the right. If you look at connection, you will see a number of things here. So actually we, this, the, the managed service registry uh, supports three APIs. So there is the core API, which is like the, the let's say the native API for a uh, service registry. We have a compatibility API and compatibility here is with the Confluence Schema registry. So that means if you would have applications that now today use Confluence Schema registry, you can port them without hassle to our service registry by using the compatibility API. And then another API that we support is an upcoming standard 
from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which tried to standardize an API for schema registry. So we support that API as well. The one that you're going to use today is the core API. So I'm going to need that URL in uh, when I configure my Quarkus application. So I copy that to the clipboard and I paste it there where I paste all the other things like my bootstrap server and my client ID and client secret. So that's one thing. And second, I also need, because I'm gonna publish and retrieve schemas, at least my applications are gonna do that. So that means that I need to give uh, access permissions also in the red service registry to my service account that I created and I can do that so if I go to the service registry, we're going to do that in a second, uploading artifacts. But the first thing I need to do is uh, set access. That should normally open a window with access rules. Should, but that takes takes a while, not sure what's going on here. Let me refresh to see if that comes back. Service registry instances. Okay, yeah, uh, refreshing help. So there are no roles assigned. I grant access. So you can select again, a service account here. I'm gonna use the same one, my DevNation service account. And the role that I need is called manager. The manager can write and read artifacts from the service registry. So that's what my application is gonna, my applications are gonna require. So I can save this and you see that my service account is now a manager. So that's a little bit the setup. Now, before we move to our, uh, our applications, I think we're still good with time. I think so what I can quickly show you is what you see in the guide in the workshop guide is you can is this part here you can like uh, upload artifacts from within that UI and even manage them so what I can quickly show is how to upload a artifact in the service registry okay so you can do that from this UI but you can do that through the API as well and your applications can do that automatically. But if you do it through the UI, you have like a wizard. So you can take a group. Let's take here the same, uh, uh, let's take the same values as in the guide. So a group is a kind of namespace if you want. So I can give it a ID, what I use here, my ID, that's fine. I can auto detect the type or I can specify it. So we support a number of kind of schemas like XML, WSDL, Kafka Connect schemas, GraphQL, Async API, Open API, Avro. So let's let's use Avro. And then you can drag a file if you have it on your if you have an Avro schema on your file system or something, but you can also just copy paste it. So if I go to the guide. This is actually my schema and there is like this copy lo logo here, this copy icon. So if I click on that, this is copied and I can save it here. Okay, and if I do upload, this will create my first artifact that is now listed here. So you see it has a group name, it has an ID. The name comes from the schema itself and you see that it has a global ID and a content ID. So this ID will be used by applications to retrieve the schema when they need it. I can look at the content and you will see that it's exactly what I upload. Okay, so that's that's a very simple Avro schema. For sake of time, I will I will leave that here. If if we got time at the end, I can come back here and uh, see how you can use validity and compatibility rules to manage the versioning and the evolution of your schema. But I think for the sake of time, I think it's best that we move to the third part where we were going to start using our Kafka instance and our service registry through some uh, Quarkus applications. Okay.
okay so we're now here we did the uh the uh the uh we accessed our uh, dev sandbox we started up code ready workspace now we need to build our workspace so if i one of my tap this step here has like a uh i'll maybe make that a little bit smaller first because at the moment yeah so there are several ways to create workspaces so code ready workspace is a browser-based ide cloud native browser-based ide which has the notion so it allows you to pre-configure a complete ide so one one use case is you have a team of developers and they all need to work on the same project so you can set up the the ide with the project source and all the tooling that they will need in the code ready workspace and then hand that over through a dev file to every of your developers so that they can very quickly spin up a workspace that's completely pre-configured. So we have some sample workspaces here that are pre-configured. For this workshop, I made one myself, which is hosted in Git. So you can import the Git URL. And if you go to the guide, that's the URL that is here. So I can copy this, paste it here. And then do create and open. And this will create a workspace based on the dev file that's part of this Git repo. So if I do create and open, this is now going to be created. That might take a couple of minutes as well because he needs to pull some images for the works uh, for the workspace, etc. So uh, if I go to logs, I should be able to follow this. Uh, at least something should get starting here. So well, it's... I can also see uh, if I go back to my topology of my dev thing, things should start to appear here. So for my workspace that's being created. That takes a while to get started. Not a lot. Okay, it starts to it start to do stuff, so we can uh, we can see that here. So why this? Because this is going to take a couple of minutes as well. Maybe I can go back to my service registry and show you the thing with the compatibility rules. OK, so let's let's uh, my workspace come up and I can go back to my service registry. OK, so I have now here a artifact that I uploaded myself. I can now enable or on a global service registry level or on a per artifact level, I can enable content rules, so validity rules and compatibility rules. So I can, let's say, enable the validity rule. And then I can say, OK, so that, for instance, every new version of that artifact that I would upload needs to be valid. And here, for instance, I say syntax only. I can also enable compatibility rules where I have a little bit more choice. What I can do for the sake of this example, let's say that I want backwards compatibility. So that means if I create a new version of my schema and I want to upload it, I want to make sure that that new version is backwards compatible with my existing version. So do not break applications. Okay. So now that those rules are enabled, I can upload a new version of my artifact. And let's first see those rules in action. Let's say I need to go back here to my create a service registry instance. And I have here a new version. So we're to the end. OK. 
Okay, here we have. This is would be what you see here, a new version of the same uh, schema. The difference is now I have a new field here. So full name also has now the notion of a middle name. And in Avro speak, the way this is defined, that means that that field is mandatory. That also means that it's no longer compatible with the previous version because the previous version didn't know that field. So it cannot be mandatory for older versions of the schema. So what I expect now, if I copy that and I try to upload it, is that my compatibility rules will refuse this version because it breaks the backwards compatibility rule. So let's upload my artifact. And indeed, it says the content is invalid because I have a incompatible difference. So I do a rule violation exception here. And this is this mandatory field. OK, so I have to fix this. And to fix this, I can, and I go back to my guide, I can go back to a version of new version where basically that's what you see here in this line. I made that new field optional. It's the middle field is part of my schema, but now it can be a string or it can be no, and the default is no. So that's how in Avro you define an optional field. So that means that this version of my schema is backwards compatible with the previous one because my new field is entirely optional. So if I try to upload this one, it should normally be accepted. If I upload that, yay, that kind of works. So now you see that I have two versions of my artifact, one, two, and the latest, which points to two. And you see that my new version has a new global ID and also a new content ID. So, and I can go back and forth between my two versions here, okay? So this is just an illustration of what you can do with like version management stuff like that completely through the UI. Now, let's go back to my code ready workspace, which in the meantime, have been at least started up. And now you will see, okay, before to finish the, the start of my work workspace, there is like this little bit annoying thing, but I don't know how to disable that. But because I'm, I'm importing an, a couple of projects from GitHub into my workspace, the, uh, the ID asked me if I trust the authors of that GitHub repo. Considering that I am the author, yes, I do trust myself. So I can click, yes, I trust. And then you will see that two projects are being imported. And those are the source code of my Quarkus application that I'm going to use to actually send, uh, produce, and consume messages. So the rest of those things I can ignore for the moment. Yeah, I'm not going to install extra plugins for this. So uh, I'm going to ignore that message. I'm going to ignore all the other ones. So I'm going to make that a little bit wider. So what you see here is that I've got two projects. I've got a producer and a consumer. Those are Quarkus applications, Maven applications. So you have like the normal Maven structure. And I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to launch my, my consumer first. And then I'm going to launch my consumer. So we're going to launch them in the IDE. I'm not going to really deploy them to OpenShift. I'm going to run them in what we call Quartus dev mode directly in my IDE. So let's start with the consumer. So you have a pump fight. So before I do that, the way it's going. So we're using Avro. So in my source code, there is a Avro schema. Um, so it's also a very simple schema. So uh, it has like a namespace and then it has a record type, which is like uh, it's type record and the name of the record is a quote and the quote has two fields. It has a name field, it's a string and it has a price field and that's an int. And we use the same, the same schema obviously for the producer. So the producer is going to create Avro, going to create Kafka messages 
which represent the quote, so an ID and, an, and a price. And the consumer is going to consume those messages and show them in the browser, in a browser window as they arrive. So we use Quarkus. So that means that the source code is actually very, very simple. It has like one, there is one class. So we use like reactive messaging in Quarkus. So I don't have the time to go too deep into details. We have like seven minutes left here. So basically, but it has a notion of channels and uh, I'm gonna produce, could consume from the channels and then produce a server, an SSZ stream that I can consume in my browser. Okay, uh, and then most of the things here happen in configuration. And the way this works here is so you have a number of configuration. So I need to configure the my registry with a realm, an OAuth server URL, client ID, client secret. So that's my service account, the registry URL that we copied before. And for my Kafka instance, I need a bootstrap server and I need uh, to configure authentication as well. So all those things now I can use environment variables for that. I'm going to set those in a terminal in the IDE and then launch my Kafka application. Okay. So uh, let's do this. What I can do in... Uh, in my uh, ID is I can launch a terminal. So if I go to the top menu and I do, I click open terminal and specific container, you will have a number of choices. The one that we are interested in is I have configured a Quarkus Maven container and that's exactly what we need, a terminal in there so that I can launch, I can launch my Quarkus application. So, and then I can point to one of my two projects here. So I said I would do the producer first. No, that's not correct. I'm going to do the consumer first. Sorry for that. Quark is maven. Consumer first. So that points to my consumer work, work uh, project here. So I need to go to the consumer subdirectory. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, that I don't need. And I need to be CD consumer. Okay, and if I go, you will see that I have the structure here with my POM and my target, exactly the same thing that, you would, that you, you would see in the overview. The first thing I need to do before I launch my application is set all my environment variables. So if you go into the guide, uh, use Quarkus applications. We are somewhere, we are kind of here. So you have like this whole block of things. The thing you will have to do is replace all this with the values that you copied before from your Kafka bootstrap URL, your registry URL, all the things that I pointed out. Now I have done that while I was speaking. So I have my all my uh, environment variables here. So with that, I should be able to launch my application and this should uh, at least launch, uh, this application should connect to Kafka and then wait for messages that are posted to the quotes topic. So to do that, I can do Maven, compile, and then Quarkus Dev. So Quarkus Dev is actually a very useful thing to run Quarkus application in uh, directly in your IDE or in a terminal with automatic debug and stuff like that. So very useful. So if I do that, that should build my application. It might have to download the internet first. Remember, this is Maven. No, this is fairly quick. It's good. Okay, so it build the application. Now it's gonna start start actually the application in dev mode. So we should we should see some 
stuff happening here on the terminal. So actually my application starting up, there we go. So we have my all my uh, my uh, my Kafka in uh, things here. And then, so this all seems quite okay. And then it says here, this pop-up process codes endpoint is now listening on port 8080. And I say yes, because that will open directly in this will open a new a new uh, a new a new tab in my browser pointing directly to the application okay so you will see now i'm on the price the quotes page of my consumer application but nothing is happening here because there is no producer that sends quotes into the application so that's what i'm going to do now and i have a couple of minutes left that should be just sufficient so back to code ready workspace I open a new terminal for my producer. So Quark is Maven, and it's the producer that I want. Okay, the subdirectory here is producer. Okay, I copy the same block as the, for the consumer. I'm not gonna go here through the application properties and stuff like that for the sake of time, but they're very analogous to what we saw. So uh, basically it uses the same environment variables. And now I can do the same thing here, maybe compile and then Quarkus F. And that will launch my producer app running in my terminal, in my IDE on Dev Sandbox. So, uh, so it's going to take a couple of seconds as well, compiling, then starting up. Yeah, this error can be ignored because I have now two dev, uh, two, uh, two applications running in dev mode. So they, all, they both try to use port 5005 for debug, but I'm not using debug for this one. So I can ignore that, that error. So that should not prevent my application from starting up and start... I can ignore this one. I don't use port. So there is no, actually no real uh, UI for this producer. So uh, I can click no here. And this normally, my producers should be starting producing messages. And the easiest way to see that is by refreshing that page here. And if the demo gods are with me, yes you see quotes appearing. So every couple of seconds, a new quote will appear. So what happens? My producer sends messages in Avro format to the topic. The consumer retrieves the schema from the service registry. And I will show that in a moment where that schema is and deserializes it and shows it on that screen. And so to finish up, if I now go to my service registry instance and I go to the, the, the dev nation here, you will now see that I have a new artifact. So that artifact was pushed there by the producer app who couldn't find a suitable schema based on the topic name and the, uh, and the namespace uh, in the registry. So it pushed the Avro schema automatically to the service registry and uh, uh, added the global ID of that schema into every message so that the consumer can retrieve it from the service registry. If we look at that schema, it's an Avro schema. You see it has like also a name, a group, the things, it has its own IDs and I can look at the content and I can format it here. And this is exactly the same as what we saw in Code Ready Workspace. I might still have open here. Yes, this is exactly the same as the one that was part of my source code. So that schema is now part of my service registry. And it, this kind of... Uh, concludes my demo. So there is still a cleanup section. Yeah, you probably want to, or 
if you want to, I can, I can stop my applications here by doing control C. So if I do once more, you see that those, those codes, they come in, they keep coming in. So the producer produces them, consumer consumes them and everything works as expected, which is always fun. So I can start, I can stop my consumer here, just do control C. I can do the same for my uh, producer, the same for my consumer. Oh, and I can restart them as much as I want. So, but that that's what uh, that's what the workshop is all about. I don't know if there were I think I haven't took care uh, took care of questions that were in the chat, I think. So as far as I'm concerned, this is it. So if you followed along. You have your Kafka instance, you have your service register instance, so your Kafka instance will stay up for two more days. So feel free to experiment with it if you like. Your service register instance will even stay on way longer. Uh, you can delete it if you know that you won't use it. You can create another one whenever you 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 uh, you feel like. So based on your on your Red Hat ID, so. Uh, You've seen how easy that all was. So with that, that's it for me.